they're supporting all these causes, but they're not supporting their own people. And it's a completely illegitimate binary that doesn't make any sense from a political standpoint. If Iran did not support anti-imperialist causes in the region, Iran would not exist as it does today. <laughs> it would not, it, like, its borders, it's surrounded on all sides by American military bases or reactionary Arab governments. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it has to support anti-imperialism across its borders in order to maintain its national sovereignty. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. We're told by US leaders and media that Iran is leading an axis of evil, spreading its malign influence through nefarious Iranian-backed militias and proxies. This is why Iran must be sanctioned and its economy destroyed. It's why we have to foment regime change and destabilization campaigns. It's the reason Iranian scientists must be murdered, somehow in the name of human rights, democracy, and women's freedom. We've seen this playbook before. We've been bombarded with these talking points for decades. Whether Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, North Korea, Venezuela, it's always the same script. So why is Iran so demonized? Is it really about women's rights and democracy? Or is it because Iran, since its revolution, has been a staunch supporter, both ideologically and materially, of resistance to US imperialism across the region? Here to help us understand, is Nina Farnia, assistant professor of law at Albany Law School, a longtime activist, and a scholar of critical race theory, with a focus on U.S. imperialism and its impact on domestic law. But before we jump into it, this is just the first half of this episode. The second half is available for Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Nina, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rania. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. I think this is going to be such a fantastic conversation and a very important one. We're going to discuss Iran, which I mentioned in the intro. Um, and before we get into like more of the sort of recent things uh, that we're going to be talking about, I think it's probably a good idea just to set up some like background for for people um, who maybe aren't so familiar with Iran or just need like a brush up. Um, and so I guess with that in mind, can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, Iran's, you know, uh, position in the re in the region, like pre World War II? Uh, what was going on in Iran pre-World War II and then maybe just like after World War II? Because, I mean, this was a crucial period uh, that we often hear about where, you know, the CIA and the, and the British got together and overthrew a government. But what was happening before that? So um, Iran was actually in the early 1900s, one of the first places where oil was exploited in the region. And it's interesting because on the one hand, Iran was never former, former, formally colonized. It was never a direct colony of the Europeans, but they still were able to take control of its resources through the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And so this happened in the early 1900s. Um, throughout the shortly following that, as the um, Russian Revolution was unfolding, uh, a communist movement developed in Iran. And so by the late, you know, during World War I, there, there was a powerful communist movement, you know, calling for secession and, and doing sort of interesting things. Um, by the late 1920s, there was a very strong labor movement in the oil and gas regions. And they were organizing massive shutdowns. And that extended through the 30s and 40s. And actually, by, by the time that Mossadegh, the prime minister that was deposed by the CIA and the MI6, by the time that he took power, um, the reason he had such a strong force behind him is because all the workers at the oil and gas refineries around the country, this amounted to hundreds of thousands of people, 
or engaging in work stoppages, stoppages to take back control of Iranian resources and national wealth. And so Mossadegh came into office. He rode on that wave. He can't, he was re the reason that he continues to be loved so much and people continue to talk about him is because he was really a people's candidate. Even though he was not a socialist, he was not a communist, he was, he was a, um, a liberal nationalist. Right. And of course, as we know across, whether it's Iran or like all the, the rest of the Middle East, any, any sort of like liberal nationalist that nationalized anything uh, was seen as a threat and potentially like a harbinger of, you know, socialism or communism, uh, even if they weren't. But of course, you know, like you mentioned, he's this very popular leader. I'm, I appreciate that you mentioned like the movements that led to like his rise, because often that gets left out, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, we just hear this one leader came to power, was really popular, mm -hmm. nationalized the oil industry. And that was the end of it. But then you do have, you have the CIA, you have MI6 uh, participate in this coup um, in 1953. And then, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and then what came after? Yeah. So the coup is significant, not just for, so people call it the first CIA coup, right? And then it happened right before uh, Guatemala, um, the coup in Guatemala. Um, but it also happened, people don't talk about what had happened right after, which is the Korean War. And and so the U.S., this was the early days of the Cold War. If you sort of frame the Cold War in the, in the traditional years, right, following World War II, not take a long look. Um, this is the very, very early days of the Cold War. The U.S. was very anxious about the Soviet Union and the fact that all these nations around the world, either decolonized nations or decolonizing nations, were no longer interested in lining up behind the United States. They did not support the in Europe. They did not support Europe. They did not support the United States. They were sick of being exploited. And the Soviet Union represented an alternative that seemed liberated right? Or at least sought liberation for the people. And so um, the Korean War happened because the United States wanted to make sure that the peninsula uh, did not turn communist. Mm -hmm. Then the coup in Iran happened. And when the coup happened, they replaced Mossadegh, they put him on house arrest, and they replaced him with the son of the previous monarchy, the, the monarchy, basically the, the Shah. Um, and his father, who had been in power prior to the coup, was brutal, but he is remembered as having developed Iran. So there, you know, there are bridges, there's all kinds of infrastructure that people still attribute to his reign. Mm. Um, his son was not like that. His son was incredibly exploitative. He was, he, people talk about him as the lapdog of the Americans, and he was incredibly repressive to the point to where by the end of his, by the time the revolution was um, about to occur in the late 70s, uh, you know, mainstream NGOs were writing about the Iranian government, well, the monarchy, as one of the most violent governments in the world. Wow. And that's saying a lot because there was a lot of violent governments around the world. Um, and I assume, of course, like this, you know, his position in Iran uh, also came in conjunction with Iran having close ties with countries like Israel um, throughout his reign. Uh, and and, and as, as well as uh, I'm sure the I imagine the situation with the oil changed. Um, that oil was no longer something that was nationally being used to develop the country, didn't have an opportunity for that, uh, along with the sort of domestic repression that you're talking about. And we could go, I mean, we could do a whole episode just on life under the Shah because um, there's been a lot of work done on that and it's not good. <laughs> um, however, then we get to the late seventies. And I think this is an interesting moment because of course, like the, you know, sort of like the brief, the very short thing here is there was a revel, there's an Islamist revolution or an Islamic revolution in 1979 that took the country away from the Shah and put it in the hands of like you know, a bunch of religious people. And that's sort of like the mainstream narrative about Iran. And then from then on, it's a bad country. Um, <laughs> but a lot, a lot more is going on, though, with this revolution. Um, it wasn't just as simple as that. It wasn't just as simple as like people being taken hostage at the U.S. embassy. There was a lot happening in the lead up to this. And in fact, it wasn't just Islamists that were initially involved in this. There was a lot of different uh, parts of the country, a lot of different parts of society. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about that. And then maybe we can get into one of the more controversial topics, but I think you have a really interesting take on it, which is this kind of like fight that took place between 
the Islamists and the leftists? So, um, like I said, Iran's had a long-standing left, as I said earlier. Um, it had, it's had a long-standing women's movement that overlaps with the left, but is also, um, there are liberal elements to it, and then there were also Islamist elements to it, so they call themselves Islamic feminists. Um, in the lead up to the revolution, uh, there were a series of united fronts that were established, and even in the days following the revolution. And so the revolution was actually organized on the ground by left forces and Islamist forces and women's movements. Um, Ervan Abrahamian has an excellent book called The Coup. It's on the 1953 coup of Mossadegh. Um, one of the things that he argues in the book is that were it not for the coup, uh, Islam would not have had such a significant role in the revolution, and it may not have become an Islamic Republic. Hmm. I'm not sure that that's the case. I, I, the book is a brilliant book. As, as, for, as a historical book, it's excellent. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that attributing the rise of the Islamic Republic to previous US interventions is, is correct. Um, and I say that because uh, Iran is an Islamic country, and the, and the people are believers. They are. And, and the majority of people in the world are believers. And so, um, and we know we like to think of the U.S. as secular and whatever, but it's not really, right? I mean, and it's just not. So a secular country wouldn't be taking away women's rights. To, exactly. Uh, yeah. Control the reproductive the banner, yeah. Right. So, and, you know, praying before all kinds of, you know, events and things. Anyway, in any case, so there were a multitude of forces that were involved. There was a very large left that was divided. They called, there were people that were Marxist-Leninists. There were people that called themselves Maoists. I mean, there was a very significant and vibrant left. A lot of them were in the United States. And when the revolution looked like it was on the horizon, folks went back and then they engaged in revolutionary activities. There were a ton of marches and um, events. And it was a it, people recall that moment as being like a beautiful moment, um, a very with full of promise and hope. Um, and uh, it then uh, the Shah left and Khomeini arrived and they held a national vote, a national referendum, um, which people talk about as being, you know, um, uh, not really a vote, um, but something like 98% per, of the country voted in support of an Islamic Republic. And Following that vote, um, the there there were uprisings in different parts of the north, really, that were led by communists uh, to challenge the rise of the Islamic Republic. There was also within the politicians that had taken leadership then. There was a lot of dissent, and so you know there was just fight infighting, dissent. There was not uniform agreement. Uh, what historians say is that Khomeini really um, took control um, and established his presence as the new leader of Iran. There were also at that time, in addition to the left, there were women's movements that were marching in the streets. They did not want people, women did not want to wear hijab, well, a certain segment of the population mm -hmm. did not want to wear hijab. They didn't support mandatory hijab. Um, and then immediately after the war on Iraq happened, I mean, the Iraq war, Iraq invaded. And, and so all of a sudden, all the energy that had gone into determining what the fate of Iranians would look like, what kind of government this would look like, you know, it was obviously an anti-colonial and anti-imperial government, but was it also going to be a Marxist government? Could it have become a feminist government? Mm -hmm. All these questions, were completely set aside in order to defend the sovereignty of the nation in that war, in the Iran-Iraq war. And Iraq was funded by the United States. It was mm -hmm. it, arms, the money, all came from the United States. So this was one of the first major proxy wars in the modern era. 
It was a massive proxy war. It devastated both countries. Both countries lost a ton of people, both young men and young women who fought. Um, and it, for the Iranians, it was destructive, not because of what it did, but of the promise that it destroyed mm-hmm. in that post-revolutionary moment. That's a really interesting way to put it. I mean, just hearing you describe that, it kind of makes me think back. Obviously, it's not as big as a country, but Iran's quite a large country. I mean, it's got like, you know, now it's got like almost 90 million people. Uh, But when you were describing that, it makes me think of like the Soviet Union after 1917, like being invaded by all or facing potential invasion and actual invasion by all of these colonial countries. Uh, And, you know, that, of course, making it the Nazis, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like we don't know what the outcome. Yeah. What would the Soviet Union have been if the Nazis hadn't taken power in Europe, the Nazis and the fascists? We Mm -hmm. we would, you know, and And I'm sorry. No, 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 no. But that's that's a really good point. That's not to say that, like, important things didn't take place. But um, I just think it's an important point to make because obviously we're speaking to a mostly Western leftist audience. I mean, that's who watches this show. And this is an issue I see come up often is like you do have this tendency and I'm not brushing the Western left for this. I'm from the Western left. So like, I'm not trying to criticize, but you do have this tendency to like lack this sort of nuance here of what happened. And also kind of like not really recognizing, like you mentioned the fact that, you know, at the same time as we would have loved to see like a leftist Iran, right? They're the country, the majority of the country actually is quite religious and is still quite religious. And I actually, I remember you gave a talk. I saw you giving a talk at the People's Forum uh, a couple months ago when we saw each other. And you actually made this particular point about how, like, was it a loss for the left? Sure. But, like, what was, like, what, what, what would the bigger loss have been? And the bigger so, loss would have been, go ahead, yes, please. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, what I said then uh, is that the left lost, right? That's it. And um, it was a bad loss. Uh, but a bigger loss would have been if the Americans had retained control, or if the Americans had toppled the Islamic Republic through the Iran-Iraq war and then taken control, in in this case, now we would have a completely different government and God knows how bad that would be. Yeah, in a very different region. You know, making this argument like 10 years ago or I don't know, 15 years ago, people would lose it. But now it's you, they take pause because now we know there's Syria, there's Libya, there's uh, Iraq, there's Afghanistan. It, you know, the, the alternative is not, the alternative of war is not better than having your opposition in power. Mm-hmm. It's just not. Exactly. And I mean, I think another like important distinction to make too is like oftentimes you'll see these memes. I'm sure you've seen them on the internet, on Twitter from the sort of like exile community, which we'll get to um, where it'll be like, here's Iran pre like 1979 oh, and here's Iran post. And it'll be like this woman in a mini skirt um, in like 1965. And then it'll just be like all these women wearing like Shador's uh, in the next photo. And I'm just curious. I, I raised that just to say like, there are, very important uh, changes that were made in Iran post-1979, mm-hmm. right, in terms mm-hmm. of even welfare policies across the country. I mean, you talked about how under the Shah there wasn't development. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot changed after 1979 in terms of, like, actually giving people access to, to things that they need to survive, um, mm-hmm. as well as the sort of policies Iran implemented around the region, which kind of came later after it, like, came out of this uh, you know, devastating war with Iraq. But I'm just curious if you can talk about some of those differences in terms of the accomplishments uh, of this revolution post-1979. Mm-hmm. So the the Islamic Republic is a welfare state. Um, it, it, it's not an avowedly socialist state, but it is a welfare state. And up until the, the contemporary sanctions regime, which has really impacted the population severely, um, everything was subsidized. And, and so in the early days, uh, the literacy rate went up dramatically. Access to health, especially among women, access to health care went up dramatically. Uh, now the majority of the student population is made up of young women. Um, women are very present in the workforce, uh, very active. Um, uh, and then like everything was subsidized. So oil and gas were subsidized, condoms were subsidized. I mean, like everything you can imagine was subsidized. 
And so it, it truly, there was a massive development program that was put in place following the war that really lifted up the population. And that continued. And then you you probably know, you, then, you know, later on, there's also all kinds of cultural development. So the, the government really supported the arts. Um, some of the, you know, Iranian artists were traveling to Berlin. Berlin was the, I don't know what the capital of the art scene now is, but for a while it was Berlin. <laughs> Iranian artists were traveling to Berlin, selling their art. Iranian movies were, you know, considered the best movies in the world. Um, and so... It, there was an, it was an excellent, there was a lot of progress made across multiple sectors in society. Um, the sanctions have really impacted that. And that is, that was, that's the goal of the sanctions. The goal of the sanctions is to cre- destroy civil society, to destroy people's lives. Um, and they haven't been successful. The, the sanctions have not been as successful as the Americans would like, um, but they have impacted the quality of life for Iranians. Of course. I mean, another part of the sanctions, too, is supposed to be to make it harder for Iran to help all these other groups across the region that it has alliances with, whether we're talking about like Hezbollah or its support for maintaining the sovereignty of the Syrian government uh, or it's, you know, it's collaboration with groups in Iraq that helped to defeat ISIS or, of course, with Palestinian resistance groups, which, you know, that's another reason Iran is targeted like this, right, is to stop yeah. that is to stop iran from really being the at the center of anti-imperialism across the region i mean when we talk about what would have been different in iran it would have been yes a way crazy like level of repression that get had under the shah but you also would not have this level of material support for resistance across the region and we can we can mm-hmm. get to that but i just very quickly before we move on from the topic of sort of like during the revolution and then after, because of course, all of these communists, a lot of, uh, I think all of them left, right? And you do have this like exile community no, in the US. Some folks yeah. stayed, a lot of them are here. Or, know, uh, in well, Europe. Right, and they're, that too. But I'm just curious, like, and I asked this again, not to like, it's easy to say to finger wag, like, you know, decades later, but you know, I, I've had this conversation with people about the Arab left, for example, because the Arab left did not succeed for a lot of reasons uh, in places like Lebanon, especially during the Lebanese civil war. There was also a similar fight between Hezbollah mm-hmm. and like the Lebanese left at some point or communists in Lebanon at some point um, during the civil war. And there's still some animosity about that till this day. Um, but I also think it's important, despite, of course, like the left being attacked across the region in so many ways. Um, what, are there mistakes the left made, like in retrospect? Um, you know, I um, question. I do. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a, it's a legitimate. It's a good question. It's a legitimate question. I just don't. Um, I don't. I don't like the question, and the reason I don't like it is because the weight of the world has been against socialism Mm -hmm. for a very long time. The primary enemy in the world, the primary, and it's still to the now, for the Americans, is communism. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the, the question, it should not be, what mistakes did we make? But how is it possible that we have Cuba and Nicaragua and the Soviet Union for so long and now hopefully China um, all, and Venezuela, all these countries? How is it possible that these countries have managed to survive and even thrive against all of this repression and devastation that the U.S. and its allies in Europe and Canada have sought? That's that. I think that's the question, and in the, I, if you think about it in historical terms, Latin America decolonized about a hundred years before our part of the world, or more, and so, and I mean, Simon Bolivar was a remarkable historical figure that decolonized, that that led the decolonization of Latin America, um, and I don't, I'm, we have some figures that might be similar to Simon Bolivar, but they have just not have had the opportunity to, to do what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think we're in a cultural moment where our people are, are, are going, are embracing their culture in order to decolonize and resist imperialism. And if, 
if, you know, as, as the Iranians say and the Venezuelans say, if the Americans take the boots off their necks just for a moment, there's no telling what could come next. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's a really important point. And in that uh, like sort of on that note, in terms of talking about a lot of the countries you mentioned, I mean, they're part of like the global South. Uh, and, and I, after the revolution, I mean, can you talk a little bit about what Iran's role became in the global mm-hmm. South and these sort of kind of non-aligned spaces, the non-aligned movement with its anti-imperialist foreign policy? I mean, one thing I already, you know, that, that I already mentioned is obviously their policy towards Israel changed dramatically. And mm-hmm. after the revolution, they actually converted the Israeli embassy to a Palestinian embassy mm-hmm. um, and pushed this very anti-Zionist foreign policy that is like still a bedrock of Iranian policy today. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what was Iran's role in the non-aligned sort of global South spaces? So um, as you said, Iran uh, during the time of the Shah was very pro-Israel. And at one point, um, the monarchy was advancing this position that Iranians are the original Aryans in order to align with racially align Iran, Iran, you know, with with whiteness. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. Um, one One of the primary causes behind the revolutionary struggle, and this was, this crossed all the different, um, movements was Palestine. Mm -hmm. Iranian revolutionaries among the left, the Islamists, the feminists, they were all very pro-Palestine. And so once the revolution happened, um, uh, Palestine became a central force in uh, in Iranian life. Um, And now Iran is the primary supporter of the Palestinian cause in terms of uh, resources, there is no country in the world that supports the Palestinians in the way that Iran does. And whatever resistance to imperialism there is throughout the region, wherever you see resistance to imperialism and colonialism in the region, Iran is there. So, but what's disturbing is that Iranian, like especially the, um, uh, uh, anti-regime Iranians will say uh, they're supporting all these causes, but they're not supporting their own people. And it's a completely illegitimate binary that doesn't make any sense from a political standpoint. If Iran did not support anti-imperialist causes in the region, Iran would not exist as it does today. <laughs> it would not it, like its borders. It's surrounded on all sides by American military bases or reactionary Arab governments. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it has to support anti-imperialism across its borders in order to maintain its national sovereignty. So it's, it's, not, just, it, it's not just a question of um, supporting Palestinians because that's a part of the revolutionary cause. And it's not just a question of realpolitik from an international relations standpoint. Countries have to do what they need to do to maintain their values and their principles and also maintain their integrity. And that's what Iran is doing. And it's done a brilliant job. And what you were talking about too is, I mean, something that's promoted uh, specifically by US, British and Saudi backed media that that in Persian in Iran, which uh, makes that point repeatedly to those who get the satellite stations that they can receive, like whatever the various outlets are called, uh, where they'll say that they'll say you're giving like your government, the Iranian regime is giving all this money to Palestine and it's giving all this money to Hezbollah and the Houthis in Yemen. But like, look what's happening to Iranians. Like they should be spending that money on you. Uh, yeah. And it's you know, it's a very simple black and white and easy to swallow argument um, that is really disturbing because of how many people just like repeat it uh, as a result. And and that's like where the media war comes mm-hmm. into play. But I really want to emphasize what you said about like Palestine and just Iran's centrality to anti-imperialism in the region. I mean, I'm talking to you from Lebanon and uh, mm-hmm. half of Lebanon mm-hmm. would be occupied by Israel if it were not for Hezbollah. And the primary supporter mm-hmm. of Hezbollah is Iran. I mean, uh, Hezbollah and Iran are partners. Iran's like 
like supports Hezbollah materially as well as ideologically. Um, and I mean, the ideological component is important there. Um, mm -hmm. It, you know, arming the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinians would have very few options to fight back their occupiers if it was not for Iran. Um, mm -hmm. And Syria, I mean, it cannot be stated enough how important Iran was in preventing Syria from collapsing to ISIS. Exactly. which is what U.S. policy was trying yeah. to make happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and portions of Syria did. There are huge swaths yeah. of Syria that collapsed to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and then those areas, minorities were cleansed, killed, forcibly converted. Um, women were, I mean, you're talking about women's rights, you know, look what happened to women in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the, you know, had it not been for Iran all these years, Yemen, I mean, of course, the Houthis obviously, like, work very hard to get what they got done done. But Iran was a poor, an important partner uh, in what was a genocidal war by the Saudis as well. And I just, I mean, I'm just saying that because it's worth repeating over and over. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, maybe I'm going a little too like extreme to say this, but I don't, I personally don't think, think it's extreme uh, just because of his important role in the region. I mean, Qasem Soleimani, if you want to talk about, mm -hmm. yes, I mean, was yeah. he a socialist? No. However, he was like a Che Guevara like figure in yeah. the region when we talk about somebody going from country to country and training people yeah. to literally fight ISIS and prevent ISIS from taking mm -hmm. over their territory. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons he was killed. Um, yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to say all that, you know, maybe to segue into the reason well, Iran is back. Right. Go ahead if you'd like to elaborate. When, or, or about, when I talked about Simon Bolivar and I said, you know, our region probably it has some people that are sort of like him, but not at that level. I was thinking of Soleimani. Soleimani was not, uh, uh, did not have the opportunity to go liberate the whole region the way Bolivar did, but he was able to organize the region to withstand ISIS. And if it were not for him, and I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to like attribute, you know, you, don't want, you never want to attribute everything to one person, even right. though that's what we're doing with both Bolivar and Soleimani. <laughs> <laughs> we had people and they were organized and I mean, but if it weren't for him, you, we don't know what would have come of Syria or parts of Lebanon or Iraq. Um, and so we have to think about the alternative. When we go around like attacking people and institutions, we can't just say, you know, like, well, we want something different. We have to think about like on the ground, in reality, what would the alternative have been? I don't want ISIS. I just don't. No, I, I mean... <laughs> So it, it, I, it's it's ridiculous that so many people came out against Soleimani when he died, mm. when he was murdered. A few days after, you know, there were millions of people marching in the streets at his funeral procession. Like over the the, the U.S. reports five were five million, which yeah. means it was probably much higher. Marching all throughout Iran and parts of Iraq. The day after, the two days after that. There were Iranian intellectuals. I hesitate to call them intellectuals, but they're you know at at you know professors at elite institutions, on American news outlets, saying that the Islamic Republic is in a crisis of legitimacy. <laughs> First of all, that's factually incorrect, right? You cannot say that a couple days after five million people were marching in the streets in defense of a military official. Right. In the memory of a military official. But let's set that aside for a moment. Is this really what you want to say after such an attack on the country's national sovereignty? It's just ridiculous. Oh, I know. No, it's, it's, also, it's also funny because um, you'll hear this constant bat like contradiction where on the one hand, there's a crisis of legitimacy and the regime is always about to fall. Right. On the other hand, they have a stranglehold over everything and they're so powerful exactly. that they might just totalitarian, the totalitarian autocrats. Right. And, it's like, yeah. which is it? Like, I thought, which is it? Is it this like, you know, huge, like, you know, almost about to be nuclear armed power that um, has, you know, is just like everywhere and sees everything and is, you know, Americans should be afraid of Iran or is Iran about to collapse? But of course, that's mm -hmm. often how the U.S and the various intellectuals you're talking about, uh, talk about most US enemies. Um, 
I want to ask you to, if you can maybe explain the current hybrid war on Iran. Um, and obviously we just talked about a lot of the reasons why there's a hybrid war. Um, but you know, how has, you talked about how the US has encircled the country with military bases, as well as these like US backed sort of client states. Um, though I would argue that the existence of Russia and China is changing that up a bit. We could get to that as well, but yeah. there's that, there's also the sanctions, there's also the murdering yeah. of scientists. There's, you know, for years, the US and its allies were pushing like this really vicious sort of genocidal anti-Shia sentiment to try mm -hmm. to provoke anti-Iran sentiment, like by extension across the region. Can you talk about what we mean when we talk about hybrid war and what that means specifically for Iran? So um, hybrid war is a, is a practice of war that was created, um, the, a strategy basically that, <coughs> excuse me, that U.S. government officials developed, um, U.S. military officials developed. And one of the people that um, it can be attributed to is Mad Dog Mattis. Um, <coughs> excuse me, he was a general. Um, he, the reason they called him Mad Dog was he was, one of the places he was quite mad about was Iran. Um, but he, he's, he's known to be a vicious general. Um, uh, and so it, the, the objective of hybrid war is to uh, conceal the, the force behind the war. <clears throat> so that, so you use a bunch of different mechanisms, fake news, assassinations, um, diplomatic pressure, financial pressure. You use every possible pressure point that you have at your disposal in order to um, get your objectives in the target country. And um, cyber warfare is very, very important. And when I, when I said conceal, what I mean is that, um, for, I'll use cyber warfare for example, if, if the target country doesn't know who attacked their electrical grid, for example, then they don't know who to retaliate against or how to retaliate. And so this is one of the benefits of hybrid warfare, that the, um, the offender uh, is somehow, you know, uh, can evade retaliation more effectively than in man-to-man -man combat. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it like that. So um, in the case of Iran, it's everything that you've mentioned, the, the murders of the scientists, everything that you mentioned, um, the proxy wars. <clears throat> Um, around around its borders. Um, but actually, a few years ago, right before COVID, I think it kind of stopped after the pandemic really hit, um, there were uh, like a series of unknown explosions across the country. Like one summer, I think there was like 20 explosions or something. Um, and it's, these were ma major infrastructure, areas of infrastructure. And they were unattributable. You know, publicly, what we read is that they were unattributable. Um, I think... Uh, um, most people probably attributed them to Israel. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and the, there's and the assassinations, there. you know, uh, have, they, they've largely been attributed to Israel. And there's um, also the ships. There's like attacks on Iranian oil tankers that yeah. are typically attributed to Israel, but we don't ever really know, like you said. Uh, and then it's hard to know how to retaliate. I also mm -hmm. think like part of that hybrid war too is that media warfare, which yes. came into play a lot during the whole like women life freedom stuff that took place uh, last late last year after the death of Masa Amini. Um, and I'm curious if you'd like to address that in the sense of, it was really frustrating during, during that time because like obviously you and I both would be opposed to, you know, any policing of women's clothing. Um, and I, you know, and think it's silly and should go away uh, and should like, that should not be a policy anywhere in the world, but we're also mm -hmm. not in Iran. You know, um, we're not there to be protesting. And also we have to understand this is happening in a country that, as you explained, is under this sort of hybrid warfare threat. So can I guess, can you talk about the way that women's rights specifically are weaponized to try to mm -hmm. attack the Iranian government in the West? So um, I'll tell you what was most troubling, what is most troubling for me about that moment and the moment is basically over um it's not it first first I, let's just share some facts right 
it was not the massive protests that people were, that Americans, that especially Iranian American academics were saying they were. Um, they, they, the protests were large, they were significant, but they were not massive. They did not stop the country. There was, you know, all that. That's number one. Number two is that um, quickly, all kinds of people started saying a revolution is happening. This is a revolution. Um, and <clears throat> and on the, so that was the left, sort of the people that call themselves leftists were saying this is a revolution is happening. The right, so the Shah's son <clears throat> and the Mujahideen al both U.S. sponsored entities, they were saying that we want regime change. Pretty openly, yeah. And then, yeah, very openly. And then over time, these two discourses began to merge, where the more powerful right was saying, we want revolution. And then these, like, you know, so-called, the so-called left, this fake left, faux left, was saying, oh, no, no, we don't want your revolution. We want a different kind of revolution. <laughs> and and I mean it's just ridiculous like y- there's no way there's no way you can have revolution or regime change whatever you want to call it right <laughs> now in the region when you're surrounded by like dozens of U.S. military bases and American wars there's no way yeah like what's gonna what's gonna come after it like yeah. you really think it's gonna be some like utopia of like, you know, women and I don't know. I don't even know yeah, what like, actually. I'm not even walking know. around in bikinis and stuff. Yeah. Like that. that's, the, that's, that's the other question. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.